Yes, sir. Probably gonna be quick, so lots of time for questions or hanging out eating pizza. Um, cool. So this is a Git checkout of the Zeppelin repository. Like I said, um, the Cassandra uh, interpreter made it in a couple weeks ago to master, but isn't in a released version or anything of Zeppelin. So if you want to try it out, you gotta you gotta bust out Git and check it out. Um, so yeah, this is just the master branch. Um, just gotta build it with Maven, our old friend. Um, the one thing you want to remember if you do this, um, you need to build it with the Cassandra Spark Maven profile so it pulls in the right dependencies. So, um, can you guys see that? Yeah. Make sure. um, so, if you plug this, uh, make sure you build it with that, otherwise, none of the Spark stuff will work. Do you have to build it? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, none of the depths dependencies or anything are in the checkout, so. Okay. Um, yeah, then starting it up is just in Zeppelin and start. Welcome. Uh, yeah, grab some pizza and beer, anything. Um, yeah, and then there it is. Oh, I'm working. I need to stop it starting. So, um, is everyone familiar with notebook style um, user interfaces? Basically, um, like I think MATLAB is probably the first notebook style interface that, you know, um, where your results and your execution are kind of intermixed. So, IPython is another good example of a notebook style. Um, and they have a web interface as well called uh, Jupyter. Uh, so Zeppelin is a notebook style interface to basically whatever. So they have interpreters for um, shell commands, um, SQL, Spark, Cassandra. Um, we'll look at the list. There's a million of them, and I don't even know what half of them are. Um, so yeah, there's the Zeppelin interface. Um, all of these uh, no, existing notebooks in here are uh, examples for the Cassandra stuff that I, somebody else wrote that I just pulled in. But um, so uh, with a notebook style interface, you know everything's a notebook, so you can go here, create a notebook. Um, here we have all that. Uh, load it up and. Um, what, so what I meant by uh, notebook style interface is that um, you get, so we'll do an example, um, we want a markdown cell, and we'll do that. Um, so what that's doing is, is setting a cell phone, actually I could probably make that bigger. Uh, that's a little better. So, um, basically, I created a markdown cell, put in some markdown, executed it, and the result is rendered markdown. Um, similarly, for anything else you'll do, um, you will put Cassandra queries in here, execute them, and get you know the results back. Um, the so markdown is an interpreter. Um, you can see all the interpreters here, um, and. You can, you know, it's extensible. So if you just add a Cassandra run, you could write your own if you had a burning desire for something. But Spark, Markdown, Angular, there's an Angular JS interpreter, which actually I think I could show an example of. Um, shell interpreter, Hive, stuff I don't know what it is. Cassandra. Um, so there's the Cassandra interpreter and all the configuration for that. Um, if you're familiar with the Cassandra Java driver, um, all of this configuration should look somewhat familiar. It's basically just how you configure the Java driver. Um, so give it some names, credentials, hosts, key space, and all of, all of that Java driver stuff. It should be, um, you can pretty much configure anything in there. 
So that's where you would connect it to your actual cluster. Um, you can also, so you can also add uh, the same interpreter twice. So, so this this you know Cassandra interpreter will be configured to connect to some specific Cassandra cluster. But if you have multiple Cassandra clusters, you can add another Cassandra interpreter. You give it another name, uh, Cassandra one or Cassandra two or whatever. Um, configure that interpreter to talk to a different cluster, and so that's how you can kind of uh, switch between different Cassandra clusters if, if you have multiple running. Um, yeah, so into the yeah, uh, Cassandra stuff. Um, so I'll probably turn my notifications off. Um, Pittsburgh Jackson Pizza or beer? Um, uh, did I go? Cool. So, uh, so, so you saw with the the markdown cell, um, the first thing you put into a cell is the um, uh, interpreter that you're going to be using. So, um, if I uh, want to do a Cassandra cell, I'll first put the interpreter. Um, and then from there on, it's so it's basically just uh, SQL commands, which you're familiar with, and then a few custom commands for um, uh, the, the interpreter implements just for kind of ease of use and, and functionality. So, but the easiest thing to do is just execute help. Um, so actually, you'll notice that um, that kind of took uh, a couple seconds, and so. Um, the way Zeppelin actually works on the back end with interpreters is uh, it starts up a new process for each interpreter. So the Cassandra interpreter itself is running in um, a separate JVM um, that Zeppelin starts up and then it sends commands to the interpreter via thrift. Um, so it took a couple seconds there because it was actually starting up that process since I had never used Cassandra interpreter yet. So the, the first command only? Right. So now, now it's up. So if I re-execute this, it takes you know no time at all. I mean, you can't even see it really happen. Um, so yeah, now that the, the interpreter process is up and running, we don't have to deal with that anymore. Um, it, I guess it's. But you should also just keep in mind um, this having you know tons. It is a separate JVM for each interpreter. So have any, however many interpreters you're using, you're going to need that much resources to run all all those. Uh, JVMs. Is that a DDBC connection? Um, to to, to Cassandra? Cassandra? Uh, no. So it's using the, the data stacks Java driver. Um, so which is the I don't think there's any JDBC bindings for Cassandra actually out there yet. But um, mm -hmm. Java driver is probably the most popular way to connect to Cassandra. Um, but yeah, so you can pull up the help. Um, see pretty much anything um, Cassandra can do. Um, the, all, all, so all of these basic commands, you know, discovery and all that stuff is um, pretty standard um, SQL. Um, and we'll get into some of those in the other examples. Um, but besides like your normal, you know, uh, Cassandra queries, um, it also implements things like describe cluster, Um, so you can get some basic information about the cluster it's connected to, uh, describe key spaces, so you can see key spaces you have. Um, uh, ah, there we go. Um, yeah. So on to like real examples. Um, so like I said, I pulled these, um, these are all example notebooks that I pulled from, uh, the guy, the guy who wrote the interpreter for Zeppelin and submitted it to them, um, I just stole um, them from him. Sorry, my email keeps popping up there. Hopefully, there's nothing embarrassing. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't actually. I'm gonna open that one. Um, so you can actually, I can point out the GitHub repository, but you can actually go pull all of these down if you want. Um, one thing you'll notice here when you first open these these notebooks. Um, Zeppelin asks you to pick which uh, interpreters you're going to use for that notebook, um, which is what this dialog is. So um, 
usually you can just hit save and ignore this part, but technically you could turn off some of the other interpreters if you didn't, you know, weren't going to use them. But we'll just hit save. Um, so uh, these demos are, or these notebooks are pretty um, in depth. So uh, feel free to check them out. I mean, it tells you pretty much everything you need to do uh, to uh, to to run through them. So um, you, you need a Spark cluster, Cassandra, um, configure some other things. Um, the right now I'm running uh, DaySax Enterprise since it bundles in Spark um, and it's easy. But obviously you can just you know set up an open source Spark cluster and open source Cassandra and that works fine. Um, so yeah, the um, one of like uh, I think I have to go away. Um, interesting or one of the um, reasons I think people like notebooks is they're they're good for this kind of uh, uh, they're good for creating demos essentially, right? So here this this is a cell um, and it's it's uh, has a title, and it's actually um, so when you run this cell, it downloads all the, the data that the demo is going to use, right? And so it's a uh, shell cell, so it's going to run all these wget um, uh, all these wget commands to pull down the data. Um, but you know, if you're just demoing this to someone who doesn't necessarily care about that, you can uh, hide the editor and just show. Um, the title and then possibly the results. This uh, doesn't won't actually have any results because it's not doing anything. So um, I just ran that. It downloaded some data. Um, there's another cell which creates the um, the tables uh, and dumps all that data in. One thing I guess to uh, keep in mind is um, the uh, Interpreter doesn't have um, create support yet, or no, it doesn't have um, copy support, which is why um, this is shelling out to SQL SH just so it can, because SQL SH has this, uh, um, actually I guess that's in the cell, but SQL SH has this copy command to copy from CSV files into Cassandra tables, so that's why it's shelling out rather than just doing raw Cassandra. Um, but yeah, we, uh oh, oh, see, we got an error. That's a good example. Um, so that returned an error. Um, the results aren't showing right now. Oh, um, and I know why it returned an error. Uh, it's because SQL SH isn't on my path. So let me. Um, so, um, I don't know why I, I didn't full screen this. Why don't you guys get a, point these things out to me? Um, one of the, an, another nice thing is these, um, so you can expand and collapse, you know, each cell individually. Um, so there's all the markdown for, for that first cell. Um, but there's also shortcuts up here for, um, expanding or, um, Contracting everything, and then you can run, you know, all the notebooks at the same time, or all the paragraphs um, in the notebook uh, at once. That's kind of a shortcut, which I'll do, so I don't have to click on each one of them. Um, uh, yeah. So we don't necessarily have to go through all of these. Um, like I said, it's kind of nice to go through on your own. Um, so you know, there's. Kind of, they're split up into sections here, but that downloaded some stuff for the demo. Um, I gotta click this again. Um, 
here's so here's getting into some of the spark stuff um, so here's a uh, um, uh, Spark command, which takes some of that demo data and rewrites it into a better data model for Cassandra. Um, uh, and then, here, let me run all this. Um, Spark would probably take, uh oh, dang it, that didn't work. Do you have Spark in your path? Uh, Wait, I, I, I might not points. have the the, the driver. Um, oh crap! I don't have. Uh, but you said oh, you came down with the enterprise. Well, it's not that. It's um, the Sparks running. It's the um, uh, Spark driver jar is an on path, and it's because. Um, I was in the wrong, uh, the wrong checkout. Uh, like I said, I kind of, this is a simple demo that I didn't prepare for a lot, so bear with me here slightly. Okay, you brought pizza. <laughs> and beer. I think the beer is more popular than the pizza. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to have a lot of leftover pizza, which... Girlfriend like. Um, okay, let's see if that helped. Let's try that. What questions do you guys have in the meantime? I want to know how it is that you tell it to make a table out of the output. Yeah, well, so um, <coughs> that's uh, part built into the interpreter. So, because um, like the Cassandra interpreter specifically, when you do a select uh, query, that comes back uh, as you know rows to the driver and the interpreters um, when it processes the result to send to, to Zeppelin UI, it says specifically, this is tabular data. And so it'll, it'll pop up automatically by default as a table. And then we'll get into some examples where you can basically change from a table to a chart or a line graph or pie chart or all that stuff. So if I write a little bash here that produces tabular data, we can turn that into a bar graph. That's all I want to know about Zeppelin. Yeah. Um, if, if it comes back, yeah, if it comes back in the right format. So I, I don't know exactly how you have to format. The bash script would have to format it so that Zeppelin knows it's tabular data. Um, Checkouts and I was playing with it like an hour before I got here, and I must have screwed it up before I got here. Um, so does it? Uh, is it able to read files directly from uh, like a distributed file system? Or? Um, well, so it doesn't. There's like, um, I mean, there's a generic, I think, Scala and in, interpreter that gets in there. Oh, oh that, right. that doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so like, I mean, there's like a generic Scala interpreter. So I mean, if you use that and have the right jars on your class path, you could, you know, essentially write any Scala code. So you can connect to Hadoop and, and things like that. But um, I mean, specifically for Hadoop, it's got uh, Hive support. Um, there might be like, um, what are the other Hadoop things? Pig, there's probably a pig interpreter out there somewhere. Um, so that kind of stuff, yeah. All right, let's try. Looks a little better. Uh, we'll run all those. 
Jesus. So, um, yeah, so this was Spark code to, to write all that demo data. I downloaded it to an interesting uh, Cassandra data model. And so here's an example of uh, what you were start talking about, um, the, a result set that is, uh, comes back in Tabular and Zeppelin knows to um, display it in a, like a table format. So this is some Spark code that is just uh, all it's doing is well, it's selecting year and unemployment percentage uh, and sorting. And so that comes back, uh, Zeppelin knows um, that's a table, it thinks year is a number apparently. Um, but anything that comes back as a table then you can also um, automatically switch to uh, any of these supported type, types of charts, right? So um, this one probably a line chart or maybe a bar chart, but you can see the unemployment uh, percentage changing uh, over time. And then the way it does that is it, it makes an, a best guess at the X and Y uh, axes um, that you might want, but you can uh, open up the settings and kind of change that stuff. So um, it wouldn't really make any sense, but I can uh, flip the axes and get that. <laughs> um, but you get the idea. So that's, I think that's uh, one of the, the big draws to uh, 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 notebook style interfaces in general, and then Zeppelin specifically, kind of. I'm also like a code generator. How, how ugly is it inside the back end? Because like a lot of the early HTML code generators mm -hmm. just threw all kinds of crap inside there. Yeah, so I'm not, I don't know how, uh, is that an intelligent good. question? Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, I, so I don't know much about the internals of, of Zeppelin, so I don't know what all it's, it's doing under the hood. What I love about this, there are a lot of like business intelligence products. There's there's Tableau, mm -hmm. there's you know, Kibana is what I end up shipping a lot because it's free. Mm -hmm. none, of, none of them let you speak any language to define how to get the data. Right. Like, Kibana sits on top of Elasticsearch, which has this wonderful query language that is as powerful as MapReduce. Mm -hmm. You would never know it using Kibana. This thing will let me write a fast script to munch the data. Mm -hmm. that, that's a, that is transformative. Yeah, and I think a lot of people use it as a BI tool, right? So you can hide all the, the code part, um, which I just clicked, and just kind of uh, expose this to you know people in the company that don't care about that. They just want to see uh, uh, some documentation about the graphs they're looking at, and then a you know pretty graph, um, and then um, so the next one is uh, reading some data using Spark, um, also some some interesting graphs, um, and then which one? There's a, you can also. Um, Can you actually just give the end user the end result, the uh, without having to having to start everything, just the graph and the ability to manipulate the graph? Right. So that's I was looking for that example, and maybe it's this notebook. Um, right. So here's a, a kind of an example of that. So um, this uh, we Zeppelin in general also supports. Um, uh, Using variables in these in these scripts, right? So uh, you can see in this um, little uh, CQLs uh, uh, query. Well, actually, this is a uh, Spark query, but it has this um, input uh, var variable marker essentially, and so that's saying I I want you know Zeppelin to ask the whoever's running the notebook for a field called albums count threshold. I'll default to some number, um, and then you know, if I hide that, um, I can, you know, give this to some BI guy and just let him plug in whatever, you know, uh, numbers they want, run a cell, and get different graphs. Um, except I need to run these ones first. should 
room, that one's going to be upstairs. Um, and then, you know, I can play with, this isn't a very, this is albums released uh, per year by decade, um, but I can play with, you know, these parameters in here. Um, so the last couple um, notebooks on here are uh, using DSE search. Um, so we won't talk about them too much, but uh, there's another, you know, some other examples of uh, user input guiding the the cell running. Um, in in this specific case, using solar um, queries to to populate the data, um, and then. This last one uh, also gives a demo of the Angular interpreter. So um, this uh, cell over here on the left side is actually, um, you know, Angular uh, JavaScript. It's um, pulling. Uh, I don't know where the actual JavaScript is, but it's pulling a kind of JavaScript file and loading it off the file system. But basically, it ends up giving you this, um, you know easy user-friendly form where you plug in uh, different values and then get the output uh, in this so, um, so you can you can really kind of create dashboards or, or report generators um, that you can kind of uh, give to people that, that don't necessarily care about how it's actually working under the hood. Um, and then I think um, Oh, and you, so you can also actually uh, switch the, the um, display mode so that it kind of makes it almost look like a report and gets kind of gets rid of the whole cell and uh, notebook. Uh, That's what you were asking. Yeah. Um, make it make it CEO readable, not right. code junkie readable. Right. right. Of course, so, you probably don't ever want to put this web facing. So yeah, Zeppelin doesn't have any built-in authentication or anything, and it's essentially a shell. So don't run this root and and don't put it on the public internet. And definitely don't do both of those at once. Um, yeah, no, and also the SEO or the SEM and probably right never find anything stuff like that. Yeah, and that's really, um, I think, everything I wanted to talk about in the demo. So, yeah, I don't know. Questions? So, uh, how portable are these notebooks? I mean, um, it looks like you have to have a specific group of data stacks for this one. Well, so, uh, yeah, so the, um, the last three, or no, the last two, 07 and 08, are, um, those are demoing uh, data stack search with uh, which uses solar under the hood. So um, as far as you could probably write like a solar um, uh, interpreter which took solar queries and, and pulled things out of open source solar as well. Um, but everything else, um, all you know zero through six, those are just using Cassandra and Spark. So running data stacks enterprise uh, for them to talk to, but you could use this uh, uh, regular Cassandra and, and Spark on your own and talk to them fine. All of that's configured um, in the interpreter. Um, so you know this is the Spark configuration. It's just talking to local host. Um, and then I showed the Cassandra one earlier. Where did that go? Um, right here on the right. I think I might have messed something up when I rebuilt, but it's working. So. And I assume you can lock <coughs> the end user out away from all the stuff behind the curtain. Um, so there's not not nothing like that that exists um, now. I'm sure they have that plan, but like right now, yeah, there's no user login, so I can't you know give users only access to the reports or anything like that. Like they would be able to. Right, so it's not, I mean, it's a brand new project that's still in the Apache incubator. Um, there's definitely- Room to grow. Yeah, definitely room to grow. So stuff like that is something they'll, they'll have to catch up on. 
Um, but yeah. Yeah, because you got to package the soap and send it out to a customer. Yeah, it's a maintenance nightmare to have them yeah. mess behind the curtain. It's pretty easy. Yeah, it would be pretty easy to, to screw up and break. Um, Pretty simple. I'm not a Zeppelin expert or anything, so. So if I was to describe this to someone, it would be a layer that rides on top of all your other Sandra parts and all that stuff that puts it into a uh, business user readable mode. I think that's one one use case, but I mean honestly, I think it's it doesn't have to be a business user. I mean, well, I mean that's what you demo. Well, yeah, that's fair, but it's also kind of just like a analysis and exploration tool, right? Like even as a, as a developer, uh, you know, pulling back um, data from Cassandra uh, and being able to graph it kind of just as I'm messing with queries, if I want to change this query, pull back different columns and you can see it in graph and graphical format, it's kind of you know, okay. it's useful. Good way to play around with your reports. Right, yeah, it's kind of a data exploration analysis. Well, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write a, you know, an application on top of it, but it's a good way to get started and kind of look at your data. And that kind of stuff. Do you feel for it? Yeah. I was the one who injected the term business user or business Oh, I saw it, I saw it, even if you hadn't injected it. Yeah. yeah. I, I want this so bad because I end up giving Kibana to project managers and to, to people at the customer all the time. So I would say, here, you can see what the cluster's doing because I stuffed this all in Elasticsearch for you. And here's a pretty bar graph that will tell you you've got this many orders pending, this many orders that have shipped, and all that stuff. And I want something that can, that will actually let me act the part where the data gets generated. Because it's, it's a pain in the ass to have to change what I'm putting into Elasticsearch in order to change what's happening on the dashboard. So what you might also take a look at is um, uh, Jupyter. Jupyter is essentially the same thing. It's a web interface to IPython. And so it's it's also a notebook interface. And actually, they have a, you can try it in the browser, which is pretty cool. Um, so that might be something else to take a look at. You can see their model is a little bit different. Like, so you create a Python notebook and everything you put in that notebook is Python. And if you want to do Spark, you create a new notebook. So it's a little bit of a different mental model, but similar to, uh, to Zeppelin, you know, this is a Python notebook that runs this Python code. Uh, so do we need to write the graphs in PNG or in SVG or what do you? Uh, well, Zeppelin's using, uh, you know, their, um, their JavaScript library, I don't know what it is, probably something built on D3, but um, I think Jupyter, yeah, I think they probably generate. Um, uh, oh, so in Zeppelin is all JavaScript, so you can just have it like as an image by itself? Um, I don't think there's export support yet, so like you can't, um, I'm sure they will add it eventually, so you can't like export this to a PDF or a uh, HTML, raw HTML or anything like that, but um, so not at the moment, but it's probably something I'll get at it. Get you a credit though. Yeah, you can um, forget. I don't know exactly how to embed it. You can. I think you can get an embeddable link to um, a notebook. Like I said, I also just recently started playing with Jupyter or with Zeppelin, so. There might be a way to embed it. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, so if there's no more questions, feel free to hang out. Anybody, you guys can help play with it if you want. Um, eat more pizza. Somebody got any Cassandra questions? Based on all that information, I'd say it's your day. Yeah, I know it is. <laughs> it's not mine, though. It's people that do.
you scroll down and click on the settings for one of graph or or the ta table. Click on settings for one of the tables. Yeah, our graph is fine as well. I think a while a while ago someone did a study on like how many uh, elastic search and like other installations are available. This is the second bar on the top, the top right. Oh, that's okay. Oh, okay. I thought you meant the, the graph. Oh, so that, that <laughs> just controls the cell. Right. So if you well, did the link, link this paragraph, uh, it might give you the link. Yeah. So that's this, how you this link. Yeah. This link you can uh, put it in your know, iframe or something. Right. And it's better. Because like you know, like Elasticsearch, like not only can you set the like make sure you like what it says, you can actually like. I guess. Like exploit the privilege. I guess you can only embed a single cell. Unless you upgrade them to one of the newer versions or whatever. Oh, I, uh, I can show you a little GitHub link. Uh, so as your data starts building the building template? No. Um, I don't know if there's actually a <coughs> company um, behind Zeppelin. There might be. Oh, really? Um, no, we, the guy that wrote the interpreter, um, let's see. Um, the guy that wrote the interpreter just kind of did it in his free time because he liked Zeppelin and wanted a container interpreter in there. Wow. So, uh, so this is his GitHub where I copied the examples from, um, and it's specifically uh, the branch called Metro Day. Um, just send me a message on Meetup or email if uh, you forget this later and want to grab the examples. But um, they're uh, they're just in here. So maybe that's another interesting thing is a notebook is just uh, a JSON uh, file on disk. So this is what all those notebooks uh, get persisted as. So there's JSON in here for each paragraph and the settings for it and the results and, and all that stuff. So um, if you just co copy these notebooks out of there into your Zeppelin or if you just run it from this, this checkout, um, you'll have all those examples. So in theory, you can also connect to a RDBMS in Microsoft. Yeah, so I mean, there's a generic um, SQL interpreter. I don't know how to configure. I think there's a generic SQL. I saw PSQL. I didn't see. I just said yeah, there was a PSQL. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I broke something when I rebuilt it. All the interpreters are being listed here, but um, basically you would use, I guess, the PSQL interpreter. Um, it would have settings like these that would tell it which, you know, what database server it's connecting to, and log in and right. user stuff like that. Uh, you just write SQL. The um, the Spark. So the Spark is actually providing um, a SQL interpreter for Spark SQL. So right now, the way it's configured, if you typed. You used you know percent SQL as your interpreter. Um, it would it would use the Spark interpreter and send the SQL commands to Spark. So yeah, all we got for this this meetup pretty simple. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Anybody got any requests for October? We don't have October planned yet. Um, there, I know there are people. I'm not um, sure why. It's not great. Yeah. I have a kind of an idea, but like, we don't really like like data section. Don't like officially like support it or sure. anything or provide anything. So I know people do it, and one of our guys from wrote up like a blog on um, some recommended settings because he plays a bit on his own, but I don't. Yeah. Yeah, well, it could be tons. <laughs> so, 
it's, it might make sense that some of the guards are just going to end up having this issue that I suppose that will go away from the where you have a ton of tables, which takes up space on the heap, so you can't have, you know. It's a lot better in these versions, but I mean, yeah. you, know, you want to keep it under a thousand or so. Yeah, some arbitrary number, right, depending on your heap size overall. Right. So, yeah. Thousands of tables is uh, not um, ideal. Yeah, so it's like when the customer you run a cluster and all of a sudden everything falls over, and you can't just back out someone's data for you. So, what's your point? Well, um, I mean, that's one of the great use cases for Spark support with Xander. It's, you know, copy data from cluster, yeah. from cluster to other clusters. Or Well, we got space till you're 30, so <laughs> hang out, have pizza and beer. Ask me any of your questions and go. It's basically a good start. Um, get your company LEs. No. <laughs> uh, probably, I mean, but if you're like absolutely brand new, um, the best place is uh, academy.datastacks.com. I've got like free online classes um, and they're like uh, self paced. So they're like structured as actual classes, but you just kind of go through them at your own pace or whatever. And then slides out, there's like a million videos. But um, many videos on data stacks. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's all on the all the Cassandra stuff is like, you know, it, I think they talk about BSE, but it's all specific to open source. It's not necessarily proprietary. Um, but besides that, I mean, I would say just just try and write uh, some sort of app like um, Twitter, like writing a Twitter data model and fake Twitter is a popular one for a while. I, for, um, I did a closure meetup. Um, Cassandra and I wrote a little fake Last FM clone. I don't know if you know Last FM. It's like a music tracking site. Um, it's like the one where they let people DJ to pick the tracks. No, that, that was that was like turntable. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, that was yeah, Last FM just um, you set your music listening history to it, and it like then gives you recommendations. Yes, that's the first started. Those videos are pretty, pretty good. Yeah, very useful. Yeah, to start with. It, so that, that's good. I would say go to the Cassandra Summit, but it's all sold out now. Oh, this one now is. Well, the short, yeah, the Cassandra days are are also good, but um, not quite as uh, big of a production as the summit. Just start somewhere. Yeah. <coughs> so I work for a UTL company, and you know. So what I want to focus on is more on uh, how to get data easily and then push it as fast as you can, like what to the engine and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll check out those videos. Yeah. Get the material out of that. Yeah, I don't know what I don't I don't keep track of what all videos we have on there, but I mean for like bulk loading and ETL and all that kind of stuff, um like I say Spark is is pretty much always the way to go. Um because it's fairly easy to set up um, and lets you do all that map produce and uh, kind of ad hoc query type stuff. So the kind of Spark is like mm -hmm. yeah, faster. Well, so Spark, cool. it, it's it's, it's, a, it's a, a map produce map engine map basically, right? So it like it's it's good for like analytics or queries. Like if you need to like load, you know. 300 gigabytes of data, um, it can do that on all the nodes at once or whatever. And then it can pull it all out of the memory and rewrite it into whatever data you want it to be. Whereas Cassandra is, you know, it's not, it's built for real time queries where you're pulling out, you know, open that 10 rows at a time and things like that, not where you're like, you know, like the whole data set. Spark? Spark? No, just anything.
in, 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 anything to do with it. Right, right. So Python, because it can use Python, and then Ruby. Yes, it can come to. It, it'll work just like a Doom Streaming does. It'll just spit the process up and pipe to standard in, read from standard out. Okay, I didn't even know about that. I, I'm pretty sure that's how it does Python. I could be wrong. Python. I thought it used Python. Yeah, it does. My hunch. Yeah, it's to show oh, it over. Yeah, okay, I'm misinformed then. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate because I really wanted to use just raw Python to do the streaming to the Spark SQL thing. But it, at least at the time, this was a couple months ago. Yeah. Uh, that project is rapid. So yeah, well. Spark, they're, they're changing completely almost. Um, so yeah, maybe they have Spark, but uh, I, I can barely keep up with Cassandra. And <laughs> yeah. So.
There's actually I'm actually learning rolling now. Oh man. And surprisingly there's also like huge it's not as huge, but there's also an Erlang uh, group here in town too. There's a good talk about uh or talk that's a post or something, uh the WhatsApp people uh -huh. you know, huge, huge global application for right. communication, right? That's all written in Erlang. Yeah. There's only fifty people that develop that whole thing. I think it was last. Uh, was it it's like a whole tech department or something. Like right. Yeah, I think like the the, the, the rumor was that like when there was up like twenty billion going to Facebook, right? They only had like forty engineers. So it's like a valuation of like half a billion per engineer. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I was I was telling the story like to someone and they're like, Well half a billion is not that much. I'm like, it's not half a billion, it's half a billion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't play about half a million either. Yeah. Odds are most people do that way. Oh. Andara was not oh, yeah. that way. No, 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 no. Well, well, yeah, that's true. But, still. <laughs> but even if they got, you know, a couple million. Right. Yeah, but those were one in a billion or one in a trillion shots. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't use Linux either. I use FreeBSD, so it was relying on FreeBSD. That's interesting. Yeah, Netflix, like, Netflix, I think it's like right now it accounts for one of the highest traffic, traffic sources on the internet, right? They're also like pretty much exclusive. Well, I, I'm not sure if they're exclusive, but they are uh, very heavy use of FreeBSD. Yeah, they contributed, they, they don't just use it, but they also like contribute uh, patches to FreeBSD and stuff like that. So they sponsor some extra development work for FreeBSD. I don't think they run other Cassandra clusters on FreeBSD. They don't? Wow. I heard for that a while there, I think there was issues with it. Maybe it works fine now, but whenever they started using Cassandra, however many years ago, I don't, I don't know if it even mm -hmm. ran correctly on FreeBSD. Yeah, I think you might be using Linux too, but uh, I think like their class, uh, their the stuff that the, their appliances, the ones that they put to the, the ones that they basically require the ASPs to have, unless they want to pay like a lot for traffic, right? Right. Uh, they they are all around with FreeBSD. Okay. Yeah. Because I yeah. I think. Well, I don't know if there's a is there free speed FreeBSD images out on EC2 because they run like all their internal stuff all up. Yeah, I think I think people do use it on ECT. Okay. Sure. Yeah, it's true. I think one of the previous committers called Colin Tercio. Uh, he developed some kind of uh, cryptographer's offer. He's a cryptographer, but he developed some kind of like backup uh, uh, cryptography backup software. So I think like all of his uh, stuff runs on PC2. Okay. You know anyone using log shipping on the side of things? Like ship it up to Elasticsearch or something? Yeah, I know you guys have a metrics plugin available for maybe something like that. Yeah, 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 we don't have anything built in for shipping. We used log for days so you can use you know whatever it's a SLF for J now. I don't know if there's a SLF for J now. I don't really understand the difference between the two. I think but, J1 changed to a SLF for J and log back. Oh, okay. It used to be log back. Okay. Well, if it's, it's log, log back now, yeah, you can configure whatever. Okay, no, there's log back and where it's not sure. That's right. I never heard of Elixir. Elixir. Yeah. yeah, that's really that's that's what gets me interested about Erlang because I don't want to learn that weird ass syntax. <laughs> <laughs> but Elixir looks it looks so cool. Uh, I can't believe it's more traction. We just got to learn Prologue first. Yeah, yeah. Erlang Look, makes so much I took this in college. I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> I also learned Java. That's what's keeping me from being a Java. <laughs> After talking to you, I was looking at closure. I'm like, this is, this is, this is familiar at least, yeah. yeah. But with all the J, with the, the Java, 
What is so horrible about Erlang Synthics that you think? No, it's just because I come from getting pissed off at C Sharp and Java and going to Python and getting really used to being this kind of weird, loosey goosey language like going into <laughs> Erlang. And it's like, I guess it's not, it's not a fence. Like, I'll read the code for a while and I realize I have no idea what the hell's going on. <laughs> Until then, I'll just go read the docs for a while and then, you know, it never sticks because I don't code in it. Have you seen Erlang the movie? <laughs> no, I haven't. It sounds great. It's awesome. There, there, there was like a couple of years ago. I, I, I was at late. I only started this one like a couple of months ago. There is also a thing called Erlang the sequel. <laughs> so, so the original, the original Erlang the movie was it was made like in the nineties or whatever by Ericsson. So, I'll give you an example like how Erlang, uh, how you can restart an Erlang application. And people who are connected, so like oh, yeah. for example, connected like via the, uh, the uh, telephone network, uh, or is running by Erlang, they still continue to be connected. And even if like one of the phones is ringing, it's still going to continue ring, uh, to ring uh, with the proper state, all while you can reload the application if one of the other calls uh, has some kind of bug in it or whatever. So, and I mean like right now, no one cares about telephone networks, right? So some guy who is one of the Erlang contributors, one of the heavy users of Erlang, he did like a remake of, of that original film, right? With computer generated voices. And like, <laughs> it, it, it's like really funny, you have to see. It discusses, it goes into like the topic of, you know, like GS and stuff like that. And it's just really funny. No, that's, that's one of the crazy things. So you don't really think about being able to, like, I, I don't even think it's possible to deploy code while it's still running. You know, you always think of it, well, I gotta take an outage or I have to roll this through my cluster, you know? Right. You know, which is fine, it should be completely different. But still being able to be like, swap a piece <laughs> out while and just not, the early game keeps running, right? And then yeah. Done the wiser. Yeah, you can, so, so the wild one, feature. It's just, yeah, they, they basically produce like an example of like a chat room. So for example, like in the chat room, you can have like uh, family, uh, 100,000 so people connected from the chat room, right? Mm -hmm. And you send a message, it only takes like uh, about a second to, to have it delivered to everyone, right? And uh, for example, maybe the chat room, the original offer of the chat room is that he wanted like to censor certain words, right? So if a per person says like a certain word, then like uh, the system, like the, the, the process that handles it, it freezes, right? Because it's, uh, it's not actually handled correctly, it just says, like, you know, like crash here, right? So the person crashes. So if you write, write something that is not allowed, then your connection crashes, right? But all those other people who are, who are connected, they still can continue chatting, like it doesn't affect them. So what you can do as a developer, you can remove that code, which makes the process crash if you say something like that, right? You can reload the server, and all the other people, they still continue to be connected, and then this person reconnects, and then he says a thing which he used to say and which uh, made the server crash, right? And it no longer gets crashed. And then people can still continue to communicate, and it's like nothing is affected. So, so of course, like I, I, that, that's like in the in the movie, the sequel, right? So I was re I, I was reading uh, yeah, I, I was reading the book, and it turned out that like you all, you're only allowed to have uh, two uh, you're only allowed to have like two versions of the code at the same time, one at the same time. So it turns out that like. Uh, unless you follow like proper proper uh, like uh, methodology, then if you reload the second time, then like all of them are going to drop, right? <laughs> unless unless you make sure that like uh, the handler is going to go like all the previous handlers, they're going to go and they're going to call the new handlers. So it's still possible to make it so that like all of the code gets reloaded all the time, and then you can reload it basically a limited number of times without anyone's connection being affected. So. I feel like it's one of those features that sounds awesome, but never gets used correctly. No, but I mean, like, if, if it's it gets something used like, correctly, if you're Ericsson making a telecom, yeah, or yeah. cause cell phones to work in the nineties, right. that 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 was the killer app for like, and, <laughs> and I mean, like, the same thing, like with WhatsApp, right? If you if you make it maybe like a video call, right? And like, if they if they need to reload to reload the software, I mean, if they have like crazy number of users all over the world, right? Even if they reload the software only once a day, if like so many users, if it's just, like 1% of the users is gonna be affected by having like their call shut down, right? That's a huge deal, right? 
Yeah, but I'm sure, but if they're smart, they already built in uh, failover handling in anyway, like in case the entire server dies, right? So right. if, 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 you, no, if you can handle a server failure, then, then doing a rolling update of your application isn't really a big deal at that point, right? Well, no, it is because like a server failure, it's still not going to happen. It's still not going to happen like for all the servers. It's going to affect only zero point zero 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 one percent of the users, right? Sure. So, and I mean, like you can't really avoid that. And I mean, if you have a server failure, I mean, well, but I, I'm just saying, restarting the process is identical to a server failure from a user perspective. So, if you can, if you build your application to handle a server server failure, then restarting the process to update the code isn't a big deal. It's not the same because, like, the when you restart the process, like those connections they keep being connected without any extra things that you have to do. Right. But right. you have you still have to build the infrastructure to handle the process down. Why, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Well, because it's something like that. Well, process. Why, why when you that? say process, you mean something a little different than what he says process. When he yeah, says process, he really means an agent yeah. inside the Erlang VM. Right, right. The thing the user's connected to never goes away. That TCP connection never dies. Well, it does at the server dies. Well, it that does it doesn't even affect your point yes, or that's, that's going to happen so less frequently. You're right. never going to see a news article that says, a hundred thousand AT and T calls were dropped at once yesterday. Right. Well, I might say that. <laughs> so, so it wouldn't be worth it wouldn't be worth the extra investment to make sure that like the hardware failures are accounted for if you can do all of those. Well, things. not when you're WhatsApp, but when you're Ericsson, they handle they certainly handle server failure. Well, then they handle it. They handle it. They still. I, I mean, I'm not sure how to handle it. <laughs> Home Depot online is shooting for 99.95% uptime for their online site. And that number keeps going up every year. It's it may get there. It may get there. See, in the last four years they've taken their downtime and just crashed it. Bad choice of words. They've taken it. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Huh? What happened? <laughs> Home Depot online uh -huh. has taken their downtime dramatically reduced it. Okay. So they're at a 99.99% uptime in some time. I'm sure. Oh, wait, if you're down, it's $100,000 in sales. No, Home Depot goes down, it's $100,000 in sales. It, it, they have teams. That handle incidents. And there are. They do million dollars. They what? They do million dollar hours. Online did 3.8 billion last year. I think like they did this, so like someone did a study of like if the server's down or whatever. I work for Home Depot. Oh, you are? I know the internal numbers. Okay. Uh, I work for a subsidiary that's actually called Home Depot. We only did 270 million dollars. Okay. So someone did a study that like if the server is down, then people are just going to come back tomorrow. Well, you've got two things. That's true. It should extend. You've got. If someone's going to go buy something on Home Depot online, they, if they can't get it, the server's down, the website's down, they may go to the store, they may go to Lowe's, they may go to Sears, they may go to Amazon. The ones that come back in an hour, you're right. That's no lost business. The ones that go to the store, well, that might be a little bit lost business because of the suggested purchasing and other things like that. The ones who go to Lowe's or Sears or Amazon, that's lost business. Now, when they sit there and say, we do a million dollars an hour, or you know, during Black Friday, we keep with time, they do a million dollars an hour, if we're down for an hour, we've lost a million dollars, they're overstating the case. Definitely. But there is lost revenue, because they will, because people will go somewhere else. That's just all there is to it. Do <laughs> but it's also I'm, I'm thinking like how how inefficient this might be that like you're you're basically like 
where do all those where, where do you use all of those computer resources for the rest of the year if you have to account like well, like Friday, right? But this is why AWS exists. Well, yeah. Like, what, and Google what Cloud. Do, what do AWS? What do they use their resources for the rest of the year? Well, well I, I mean, it's the same thing. Well, AWS exists because Amazon had this problem. They exactly. had this compute resource uh, okay. that not use right. the rest of the year, and so they said, let's let's figure out how to. Because Black because on Black Friday. Oh, so you cannot buy AWS on Black Friday? It's like no, I mean, what happens is they're, they're doing other, people are going from, they're shifting from one thing to another. Like, they may be uh, watching, instead of watching YouTube videos, they're going to be shopping. So the shift goes from YouTube to shopping. Okay. Or that's probably a simplistic example, but yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I would. You know, now that you're saying, I'm wondering, does AWS have some deal where they say NSA cool it around Christmas because they're their biggest customer? <laughs> they the NSA is probably, is probably on vacation. But I thought they have like a separate separate data center for NSA as well. They have a separate like government region. I don't mm -hmm. know if they have a separate. Remember, they, they spin those yeah. things up and they throw them away and they repurpose them like nobody's business. Well, you can only, like, with the default account, you can only get, like, 15 instances or something. So I'm sure their big customers negotiate Black Friday. Oh, yeah, you just have to call them up. And yeah. They're like, oh, you're going to use it for real and make a platform? Okay, we'll give you as many as you want. Oh, okay. Google, uh, Home Depot is talking to Google right now. Google's awesome. What? I've been using Google's cloud for the last, like, two weeks. You guys are on AWS. You're getting ripped up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Google Cloud, like they have local SSDs you can attach that are just better than instant storage. They're 375 gigabytes large. You can add up to four or six. Is there any hardware scale way? Scale way? Yeah, but I haven't actually got to play with that. They reduced the price of, like a couple of days ago. Yeah. Okay. I spun up a couple thousand of clusters in EC2 for test day. Gotta get those things shut down ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> Company, uh, they're like one of they suppose like one of the biggest uh, hosting providers in the world. Although most people like in the US have never heard of them, so, like last year or whatever. So most people never heard of them. So they 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 open up a data center in Canada and they're selling like really, really cheap servers. And the funny thing is is that they actually so you can buy like a 30 you can buy a 64 gigabyte uh, server with DDR4, 64 gigabytes of RAM 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 so, but the funny thing is, right now they also start offering like uh, KVM servers, and I think like two gigs, you can get like a two gig, well, it, it starts with two gigs instance server for like two dollars, which is like <laughs> <laughs> so. And it turns out like I did some calculations, and it turns out that basically like if you get like that two dollar server, it's actually cheaper than buying the DDR four server, right? I mean like how exactly does it work? Like how does it make sense that you buy more for memory resources if you buy like a, like a digital quantity, right? That you can buy like a whole server, like it doesn't make sense. No, it's just like the, the, yeah, how long will they stay that way? Yeah. How good are they? It's a great small. Yeah, they just want small on their Well, yeah, I mean, like, I don't think they have any kind of. I, I, I'm sure they have like hourly billing or whatever, but it's, it's still you can still. Well, like Google was submitted to submitted billing. Which is actually good. If you don't use the whole, most of the one, right? Like, you could use the whole bucket. It goes down. Well, you spin it you, on Google. You can spin up a server, use it for 15 minutes, and then drop it. Yes, it works. But I mean, the, the way the pricing goes down as you use more hours. That's how Google's pricing. So the scale way they volume, 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 volume discount. Volume discount. Use more. So the scale way, I think they charge like per hour. But then once you use like a, once you account like for 20, 20 days in a month, then the rest of the days are free. So 
the monthly price is like two ninety nine for a server with two gigs of RAM and uh, and like fifty eight gigs of SSD local SSD storage. Oh, and one IP address. So like if, if you use it like for twenty days or for thirty days, it's going to be two ninety nine. But like if you use it for less than twenty days, it's going to be like thirty percent like chunks and anything bigger than thirty two bytes. Uh, Scaleway, yeah. You can go to online.net, it's like the company Scaleway. He's asking you how to stop. Uh, just go to online.net. There will be places where I'll get errors. Online.net? Sure. Yeah, I don't want to be like that. Yeah, I don't want to be like that. Someone on internet.com. Oh yeah, these are the people, they're, they're doing, they're doing, um, this is more for an infrastructure. As a service type thing, because they're doing ARM based servers. Yeah, it's ARM. So, yeah, it's not x86. So it's... Well, why would you care? Depends on what you're running, I guess. Um... Right. Yeah, and they're only in case we care about that right now. There are only Paris, yeah. In Paris. Oh, oh the one's on the LAC. <laughs> the LAC is pretty good. It's. Yeah. across the whole ocean. Try it's using a, like, it's try using a 300 volume like, modem. That's not bad. I get annoyed when I have to connect to uh, Amazon East to the Amazon West. Okay. You can actually tell? You can tell? <laughs> well, 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 not in actual. How much crap are you <laughs> pumping down? <laughs> because the server spin up slower. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's all the New Yorkers. All the traffic, like literal traffic. You gotta put it in the car and take it over. <laughs> <laughs> you joke, but when we moved my company from uh, St. Louis to Home Depot's tech center, mm -hmm. they were talking about putting someone on a plane to bring a disk drive down. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was cheaper. <laughs> well, no, it yeah. wasn't a matter of cheaper. Oh, it was just faster. It was, yeah, it was so much data. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. No, 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 you don't understand. You cannot fathom. <laughs> okay, I am maintaining code that goes back to 1995. It is still functioning. We run an entire enterprise back end for a, comp for a company. Warehouse, accounting, uh, catalog generation, the whole nine yards. Code goes back to 19 freaking 95. It was built in house. in house. I, I inherited it four years ago. <laughs> yeah, I've got a, I got a Vizio that I call Frankenstein. <laughs> Look, it's about four megabytes. And growing. Would you have we have to use planes to ship that? No, no. When they when they move the data center. Uh -huh. the, the company, Home Depot bought them about 10 years ago. And after. I want the shirt that you're wearing. So yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. When are the cool shirts coming out? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> in, about four, four and a half years ago, they moved to the Yonks and Pikes Center Home Depot. The same thing with like the And a matter of moving all their data <laughs> and keeping, you know, having the least amount of downtime. Which, where did they move again? To all of them? Home Depot has a tech center. There are four to 500. Developers and engineers. I'm trying to get these ones. Sorry, working for Home Depot. This is their number two tech site. Home Depot has uh, 35 and 183. Home Depot has over 3,000 developers and so IT personnel, I should say. That's funny. Like, what out of the I think I have. What? What do you use? Probably 100. Which part? Excel. Use the only online. They're using online. I can only speak about online. A little bit about online. And I can speak about my subsidiary. My subsidiary runs something called Figury. It's universal. We play with Pig. We made so dynamic, multidimensional, real life data. It's what all the car dealerships in this country run. I've got 15 years in the auto industry. The Dell Woods sells and the Home Depot sells online. <laughs> went four and a half years ago, went from five to seven, and then, we and then immediately ourselves. started pulling it apart to Tomcat Grid, <laughs> and are now moving to like run DB2 for database, depends on your, uh, uh, Java for like programming stuff. language. I think I, there, are always, cool, there are some Pythons and Puppet being they used they in order the monitoring. Many, uh, uh, they they can pull, they're moving everything to Linux. 
from the QX. It's only my system would be the last one in the QX. JavaScript hamsters. They are pulling some stuff out of it. They're transitioning from what's here to get analysis totally chunks. They will use the NGS driver. I have no idea why it's on they will be you read anything about it. Like not, uh, Java. That's like a database, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're like inherited. Yes, and now I have no idea what you're talking about. Those are the ones that just say that. I've been writing a note. How old is that? It's not the one that's Java. No, there's been a note. The universe, which I programmed a base. That's true. I mean, yeah, the third phase only ended. I'm visual a few years ago, right? Yeah. Me too. Okay. So we run, like I said, we run a few hundred million dollars a day through my system. We they, no, they run a whole <laughs> they run a whole bunch. Of, you know, just like just give it to the entirely different. <laughs> Maybe my little company we I have. I used to give talks on PHP for interface before SQL was even an idea. <laughs> my little subsidiary yeah, runs Universe, way, PHP, uh, MySQL, Postgres. Turned off by default in 2.2, but we have a lamp that's still turned on. It'll still it'll still be there. Lamp stack. Postgres. Uh, is it being off by default methodology? Uh, Java. <laughs> I, my, mini, I run a mini computer. Did you say that center still it's, it's, not, it's not. It did. It's not. 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 It's